live from the Fia Barcelona Gran Via Conference Center in Barcelona, Spain. It's The Cube at HP Discover Barcelona 2014. Brought to you by headline sponsor, HP. Here are your hosts, John Furrier and Dave Vellante. Hello, everyone. Welcome to day three of coverage of SiliconANGLE and Wikibon's The Cube, our flagship program. We go out to the events and they extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconANGLE. I'm joined by my co-host, Dave Vellante, co-founder of Wikibon.org. And, and we are so excited to be a day three, final day of live coverage in Barcelona, Spain, the European version of HP Discover 2014. And uh, it's been a great show so far. Uh, HP making the turnaround, making the comeback <laughs> again, third year. Uh, Meg Whitman really putting, putting uh, putting the wood wood behind the arrow here, Dave, and uh, it's been pretty awesome. We've got some great guests here on day three. We've got Martin Mikos, the new CEO, or the new SVP, basically CEO, of the HP Cloud Group, which is the real catalyst for the transformation um, of of HP, we're going to talk about that, his his plans, what he's done with Eucalyptus, how that's going into the cloud, and ultimately what they're building for the, these building blocks for their customers. Um, we also have Antonio Neri coming on, who's the head executive of the infrastructure group and enterprise group at HP. We'll talk about the machine, their, their big kind of futuristic product, uh, among other things, Converge Systems, uh, but just great show overall, and a lot of other great guests coming on throughout the day. Um, Dave, I mean, just a great lineup. We got Paul Miller coming on, who uh, runs Converge Systems, and a, and, a, and a bunch of great other great folks uh, from HP. So, you know, big data, Converge Systems, uh, you got the machine, which is the futuristic outlook, and of course, you've got HP software across the board and a lot of other great stuff here at HP. And again, we're digging deep and finding out all the data, and really it's coming down to the fact that HP is focused, and it's showtime. And I think you're seeing the, the beginnings of this turnaround. You're starting to see the, the, um, the playbook. You're starting to see the executives taking their seats on the bus and, and the folks that are on the bus going to this destination called New Style of IT is what they're, what they're talking about, this modern way of doing business. Not 100% complete, you know, a little critical on some, some of the social across the board. I think that's one spot I want to look for more today. But overall, the products are lining up. Their, their messaging really hasn't changed over the past few years, Dave, but clearly, the executives are taking their seats, and I think there's some more reorgs to go on. We're talking to some folks in the hallway and after hours, um, you're starting to see making its way down into the trenches, and that's going to be, ultimately, Dave, in my opinion, uh, what's going to happen with HP, is seeing how this translates. It's showtime. The executives are in their seats, they got the products, they got the momentum. Meg Whitman is messaging heavily. Innovation, customer, partners three main focus areas and all the talking points, that's the focus. She's on stage, she's doing her part in laying down the framework, laying down the, the guiding principles, laying down the architecture of the new HP. The executives are taking their seats and now it's got to come down to the arms and legs of the organization, the people in the trenches, the people in the front lines, sales, marketing, engineering, R&D. If this all can come together, HP's going to be a very, very viable force. It looks pretty good. I'm really impressed. I think uh, you know, it could be sideways, but I don't see it. I see people energized. You know, Steve Deitch yesterday was very articulate about what's clear in his mind. Other executives are, have their marching orders, and ultimately it's going to come down to execution, Dave. Well, I think that I've been thinking about this a lot, John. And it, to me, it's a tale of two HPs, soon to be a tale of four HPs, I assume, next November when HP splits apart into PCs and printers and then the enterprise group. But if we look within the enterprise group, which is really what we've been focusing mostly on at this event, I think I can say there's a tale of two cities. And the, the one city is this big, large legacy install base that was created um, in, you know, at the beginning by Carly Fiorino. said, oh wow, the whole industry's consolidating. We have to consolidate and get big or die. Um, I'm not sure that was true. But anyway, that was the call that was made. And so now the enterprise group is this hugely complex collection of you know, former Compaq and digital and EDS and all kinds of tuck-ins that came together to form this behemoth. And what Herd did is Herd came in and said, all right, well, I'm just going to cut cost. This is a no-brainer. I'm going to cut cost and grind people, and it's going to throw off cash, and Wall Street's going to love me. And that's exactly what happened. And um, you know, the, to the outside world, HP kind of had its act together, and it was squeezing R&D, and throwing off cash, and it looked like everything was, was working. But in reality, 
the pieces never really came together. And that's the, the normity of the challenge that Meg Whitman has is to actually align all these pieces. And that's why I think ultimately they decided, look, we got to split these two companies up, a $50 billion PC printer entity and a $50 billion enterprise entity. Give each of those firms, those global 50 companies, focus. Now, what's happening is the other side of that coin, you've got the sort of legacy business, you got hot products. You got products like 3PAR, you got products like Vertica, you know, parts of the converged infrastructure portfolio. HP's always had you know, a lot of hot x86 servers. Um, we even heard from the services guys, the data center care service now went from really zero, they, they announced I think that product, that, that service on the cube, down to a multi-billion dollar business. So helping people con you know, convert to the cloud. And then there's OpenStack. So a lot of really promising areas where HP's pouring R&D money. So what Meg is doing is she's saying, look, I got a managed decline business, these guys are, essentially saying, we don't want to move, there's no business case to move off of our old tandem systems or old you know, HP EVAs or whatever it is, we just want to keep them. So they're baselining, they put some basic R&D in there to make them go a little bit faster and run a little bit better, maybe simplify things, but they don't overdo it. And then they pour the vast majority of their R&D into this new stuff. And then they lay out this vision of the machine, the new future of computing, which is a which is a bold vision. I'm really skeptical in the machine, as you know, but I still love it. I love the fact that HP is saying, we are going to change the world, and we have the, the, the cachet to do it. You know, I got a lot of questions about the cost structure and compatibility, how you're going to run software on it, and blah, 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 but all things that HP is thinking about, no question about it. But So to me, what Meg Whitman is saying, look, we got to make some bets, right? And we got to play offense. It's like Pat Gelsinger says, you can play offense or defense, you got to play offense in this business. So how do they play offense? They play offense by doubling down on those areas that are going to give them big returns. So that's what I see about the tail of two HPs. Yeah. And I think we're at that point now, John, where the, the new stuff is finally more interesting and taking more hold than the story of the old. Yeah, I mean, Dave, this is clearly a leadership issue from the top. Meg Whitman is clearly pushing the envelope pushing the team. Again, I mentioned that you know, the executives underneath Meg, uh, first line direct reports, as well as you know, uh, management team underneath those managers um, are in the seats, they're on the bus to quote, you know, you know, good to great, get on the bus and then figure out the destination. They kind of know the destination, new style of IT is their poster, uh, poster uh, slogan. That's considered uh, uh, marketing for their destination, which is really transformation. Meg Whitman is really pushing cloud as a transformation agent for this company, and I think that is obvious how cloud is dwarfing into this awesome organization. You know, Martin Fink came in first, Sargali set it up, Martin Fink kind of took it to the next level, now you got Martin Miko scaling it up, and you're going to start to see sales and marketing filling the gap, you're going to start to see more marketing, you see great social media action happening with that team uh, in cloud, and I think cloud is the enabler. And, I, and that is ultimately, and she says tip of the spear, a word we use a lot on theCUBE, which is great to hear her say that. Um, and it's the catalyst. It's a crisis, it's an opportunity, and, and she's taking the reins, and that's a good leadership skill. I'm impressed by that. I, I like to see her, and the, her executive saying, Meg wants to move fast. Meg is investing in innovation. This, this is not just lip service. I really see that happening. So from my standpoint, you know, I was looking at Meg Whitman, looking at her leadership style, trying to figure out, okay, is this just kind of puffery? She's just, you know, puffing her chest out, saying, hey, we're going to do this. Is it lip service? Is it, is it going to really happen? So it's very clear, the marching orders and the leadership style is like, okay, cloud is our change agent. We're going to transform this company and use cloud as the accelerant for change. We're going to shake up the management team. That I think took probably a year longer than uh, it should have in my opinion. I think ultimately this spin out could take another year off the, off the life of the turnaround. Don't know, could maybe change it, don't know. All I know is, is that those changes are being forced and she's moving fast and I think that's a good thing. I think HP needs a flash point, a, need, a moment of truth, a moment of, of staring into the abyss and saying we have to go all in and the stakes are high. They have huge, huge cash reserves coming in, they have great cash flow, great assets, a lot of products on the tool chest. Bumping up the R&D is good. And again, the messaging hangs together. Focus on the innovation, focus on the customer, solving their problems, and keeping the partners, which is a lot of indirect sales, happy and with product. So to me, 
it wraps together beautifully. And again, leadership style is critical. Using the cloud as an enabler is a brilliant move by Meg Whitman and the, the management team. Now they have to execute. We want to see the teams executing, and I'm going to look for, are they doing social media properly? Are they engaging with customers in the channels that they want to be be, be sold to and marketed to. Our engineers building new innovative products. What's coming out of R&D? I want to see that. That is what I'm looking for right now. That's going to be the meat on the bone. That's where the action will be. So I think that, you know, we do a lot of these events, as you well know, John, and when you go to these big company events, like HP Discover, the IBM events, VMworld, uh, some of the EMC events, Oracle Open World, and so forth, what I like to do is evaluate how well the sound bite crowd, the senior executive sound bites that are fed by marketing connects to the stuff that matters in an organization. And John, you know very well that if you really want to know what's going on in an organization, you look at two places, sales and engineering. That's where you find the truth. So how well are organizations connecting the sound bites from the main stage into R&D and sales motion? Well, I mean, ultimately, it's, it comes down to lip service. You, executive can only do one thing. They can only point to a direction and say, take that hill. You know, and that's ultimately what Meg Whitman has done. And I think with cloud, we've had a lot of conversations over the years at HP Discover where we've heard Sargali, we've heard all other executives that, have, that are no longer with the company and others coming in, new, new players. It's the same, it's the hill. The new hill is that new style of IT is again the, 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 the bumper sticker, but that new hill is data center transformation, software-defined data center, the cloud and big data and, and enabling developers to build the mobile apps, this new architecture. Their customers are telling HP, this is what we need, and HP saying, take that hill. Let's be competitive, let's have great products, and win on, on, on value. And that's ultimately, all so, an executive can do is point and say, take the hill. You know, now, I, if they don't take the hill. Uh, yes and no. So I, I, the point I wanted to make was, uh, was, yes, I agree with what you just said, but I think there's more that an executive can do, and I'll point to um, executives like Gelsinger, like Ellison, uh, even like Joe Tucci, who are heavily involved in execution, not from the standpoint of, okay, I'm going to go do it, but in terms of having knowledge of what's actually going, uh, going on. For example, I mean, Ellison essentially runs R&D at Oracle. Gelsinger is like a, a mega CTO, visionary. Joe Tucci, very much involved in understanding, maybe not so much anymore, but during his, you know, long tenure, understanding the engineering roadmaps and understanding what's happening in sales. For many, many years, the last you know, five years or so, I got a sense that the top management of HP was out of touch with those two critical, important parts of the company. Certainly Apoteca was, and it's taken Meg a long time. What I'm, what I'm saying is I'm starting to see those connections come together. And what I'm evaluating, John, is the quality of the people underneath. And, and, and how well they actually understand the direction that you just pointed out and how well that's turning into execution. And I'm starting to see real signs that it's happening. Uh, again, this other big bet of the machine is huge bet <laughs> with a lot of risks associated with that. That is a Hail Mary and uh, we'll see how that turns out. So Tim Crawford okay. says a lot of discussion going on about HP split meaning splitting the companies, the consumer and the enterprise, which Leo Apoteker was trying to force, um, that big board coup that happened that we covered years ago. Um, what does this mean for customers in the future strategy? So, you know, Tim, Tim brings up a good point. Uh, to me, it's very simple. HP is, based upon the conversations I've had and the research we've done, is pretty, pretty clear. I'm, I'm for keeping it, just so you know. I'm, you know how I feel about that. We talked about the wrap up on day one. However, it's just not in the cards. And at some point, the moment of truth is, will this dog hunt? And the answer is no. And the reason why, in looking at the data and talking with folks here inside the company at the executive level down to the trenches is, there's two separate companies right now anyway. It's, the culture has changed, it's not the one HP it used to be uh, when Bill and Dave were here. They had the compact acquisition, they had the deck acquisition, a lot of other acquisitions. There's a lot of different systems, they don't do the old HP planning that they used to do. All is the different fiefdoms. And I think you got to clean that up, rein that in, but more importantly, you got two separate companies, and you got to decouple those. And and in and, and good programming design, Dave, when I got my CS degree in operating systems. You have a CS degree? Yeah, I have a CS degree, <laughs> computer science degree in operating systems. And Can database. you prove that? <laughs> yeah, it's on my LinkedIn profile. <laughs> yeah. I have a degree. Um, and you actually do have a CS degree. In operating systems, what you do is you separate core functional things and you decouple them and make them highly cohesive. Okay, and that's what HP's doing here. So they already have two separate cultures. Just formalize it, just create 
a new system that clears up the confusion of what the identity of the companies allows each one to be highly effective in what they want to focus on. They can take two separate hills. One can focus on Samsung, one can focus on, on the enterprise. Samsung or Apple or be whatever they want to be and compete. HP's got good products, you know, so you know, they throw off a lot of cash. So making that a very profitable business will still allow them to cross-pollinate and, and create an Apple-like experience possibly, or like a Google Android-like experience, and that is going to be the key to success. Decouple, make them highly cohesive, and to me that's positive because there's no other path. They just couldn't make it work. Um, I think there is synergies in the channel. The risks that I would look at that you point out as a supply chain leverage, I always love channels. Having a great channel of distribution is a low way to get sales, low cost of sales, customer acquisition, and you have new things that could come out of that asset. So that's where they have to be careful. You don't want to split the assets up too much where there's not a lot of synergies, but if they're already separated and not working kind of dysfunctional anyway, just kind of make it formalized. So to me, that's my take on that uh, in general. It's, it is what it is. So, um, you know, I can only stand by my, my, initial, my initial thoughts, Dave, on, on keeping them together. And uh, you know, I remember the old story uh, I told us in the Cube years ago, when Bill Hewlett uh, built that calculator that fit in your pocket, um, they had a distribution channel for that, and that was the dealer college network, dealer channels. When the laser printer came out, which was a rogue product, it wasn't even supposed to be funded. Bill Dick Hackborn uh, funded the laser printer, and it was a rogue project out of Boise, Idaho. And Canon did all the assembly, and they needed to sell it, and HP Salesforce said, no, we're not going to sell it, so they put it in, the, in their, quote, dealer channel, selling calculators. That exploded and transformed the company from $8 billion in revenue in 1988 to roughly $35 billion by 1995. So that one little tweak, that one asset of the dealer channel saved HP from being a dying company like DEC, Data General, and these other mini computer companies. HP needs to identify their assets today that can transform them into today and put them into the future, new style of IT, whatever you want to call it. And that's the concern I have with, with breaking up these companies is that once you do that, you might lose that opportunity. So I think Meg's got to be mindful of that. I would look at that very carefully and saying, where is the leverage that they can actually take the new next laser jet moment and move it into uh, a new opportunity. So Dave, that's it, day three, we're, we're getting going. Uh, day three of coverage, let's get to it. So we'll be right back with our first guest after this short break, day three coverage, live in Barcelona. This is theCUBE, I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. We'll be right back. <laughs>